One of the key differences between ASNA2 programming has got to be object oriented programming. Because of the amount of information and the amount of practical um, stuff you need to have a go at, um, this is going to be split up into a number of small chunks. Object-oriented programming is a fundamental shift in the way we think about programming. So far, you've been used to using procedures uh, in your programming, and object-oriented programming builds upon this idea. It's fundamentally a different way of designing your code. It will allow us to have extra features, enable code reuse, and it's inherently modular. If you have any aspirations of coding for a career, then you need to really get your head around the way object-oriented programming works, how object-oriented design works, and really start to use object-oriented programming in all your programs. So, this PowerPoint is really introducing the core ideas. It's not something you've got to pick up very quickly, okay? It does take a long time to master object-oriented programming, and specifically, object-oriented design. It does tend to work better for large programs, so you probably would have uh, in the past only written small programs, so object-oriented programming isn't uh, massively useful for those small programs. But the second you start to get into bigger ones, specifically your coursework, um, then it really holds its own. Actually, as it turns out, object-oriented programming really aids with the marks, or getting the marks on the development side of the coursework. So, let's look at some of the key ideas. As it turns out, there's not a huge number of key ideas in object-oriented programming, but they are very important. There's two uh, key words you need to know straight away. The first one is class. A class is a set of ideas, uh, which is either concrete, like car, or a chair, or a um, something like that, or abstract, such as a date structure. Um, these uh, ideas, will share common attributes or data that describes it. For example, in a car, would have the make of the car, the colour of the car, and things like that, and the method or the actions that they can do. So in the car example, we'd be able to steer, brake, and things like that. Now an object is a concrete instance of a class or a member of a class. It will have specific values for each of the attributes. So, for example, if I think about my class car, I could have a concrete example of it, which might be a full Mondeo. So, objects are examples of something within a class. We have another word which I will be using a fair bit, which is instantiation. Now, instantiation is when you create an object from a class. So let's actually delve straight into programming, okay? So we're going to have a go at making this calculator. Now, again, calculator is probably one of the first uh, programs you might have a go at doing. Um, so what actions does a calculator perform? And what data does it store? Now, these two questions are really important for object-oriented programming. You need to decide what can my thing do and what data does it store or use? Now, think of a calculator as representative of everything and calculator in the world. So what do all calculators have in common? What actions can they all do? And what data do they all have in common? So the kind of actions we might have is add, subtract, multiply, divide, equals, uh, enter numbers, clear the numbers out. And the data we tend to store is the current value that we're typing in, or the accumulator. When we're thinking about classes, it's important to realise that we're not just talking about a single, in this case, calculator. We're talking about all possible calculators uh, which share the same attributes and methods. So when, when we want to use this class, we need to create an object from it. Okay, so an object is a single instance or single um, version, if you like, of uh, this of a class of a calculator. Uh, so we need to instantiate it. If you have a look um, carefully uh, in the Python syntax, you'll see there's the word self a lot. Now, this is one of the um, aspects of object programming that takes a little while to get used to is the sense that when we're talking about attributes within a class or methods within a class, if we want to use them within the exact same class, we need to reference it using a special word, in this case, self. 
Self basically means the current object we're talking about. Okay, so if we have a look at the first method where it says add self num, every single method in Python must have um, the keyword self. You can see that keyword self is in every single one of the function definitions. If I want to use an attribute or method within another method in the class, we have to use the keyword self first. So self.acc means get the current objects accumulator. This is how Python basically allows access to the um, different versions of the same variable. Okay, so every object that's created will have its own version of the ACC, its own attribute, and then to access the current object, we use the self dot. And that is, as you can see, in use in every single one of these methods. So in JavaScript, C++, and Java, and other languages of that ilk, um, the keyword is this rather than self. And in the exam, you're more likely to see the word this rather than self. But they're effectively interchangeable. Okay? So if you see the word this, it really means self. And in Python, when we're talking... So here we've got um, two calculators being instantiated. Now, this is really here to exemplify the idea that um, when you um, have a class, you can create more than one object from it. So we're not just talking about one single calculator, we have got two. Um, when you create a, uh, an object, we need to have the name of the class that we're creating the object from, and that needs to be stored inside a variable. Now the variable will um, can be named whatever you want it to be, as all variables can be, and it will take a reference of that object. So when the object is created or instantiated, uh, it will store a reference to the object inside that variable. When an object is instantiated, it's going to call the class's constructor, which in Python is the funny underscore underscore init underscore underscore. Um, that method will do any setup, and we're going to talk about constructors in a bit more detail in another video. So when we create an object, we can then use any of the methods within it by simply putting a name of it, and then we can use it a bit like any other function you can think of. Okay, so here it says my first calc dot add ninety. So the first calculator is going to have the value of ninety in it. My second calculator is then going to add five. Now, because these are completely notly separate, we're going to have two calculators: one with a value of ninety and one with a value of five. We then say my first calc sub ten. So it's going to take uh, ten away from ninety, which becomes eighty. And then my second calculator is going to add ten. So that's going to have the value of fifteen. So when it prints out my first calc equal, it's going to print out the number 80. And when it does this last uh, call to equals, it's going to print out the number 10. So one little convention, um, which you don't have to follow, but you'll probably find on the internet a lot of the examples will follow this convention. Class names tend to start with a capital letter. And it does that really to tell difference between an object name and a class name. So you can see my objects start with a lowercase letter and my class starts with an uppercase. Okay, it's just a convention, it's not syntax, you won't um, you won't lose marks if you don't do that in the exam, but it just helps tell the difference between uh, classes and objects. So we've already kind of mentioned already how um, methods are called, but let's just be really clear about it. We need an object in order to call a method first. Okay, so I've instantiated two objects, my first and my second. Um, I then put the name of the reference here, so the name of the variable, with a full stop, and then the name of the method. Because we can create multiple instances of a single class, we need a way of telling, telling them separate, making them separate. Um, we're not allowed to call a method without an object. Okay, so if I wanted to call an add method, I need an object. And the reason for that is because methods are going to manipulate attributes within the class, um, and because we might want more, more than one of them, um, we need to be really clear about which one we're talking about. So we need that. 
I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this slide, but just kind of um, for completeness more than anything else, it is possible to call um, a method without an object if we define it as static. Now, this is beyond the spec, uh, so it's not part of the spec at all, so you don't need to know about this. Um, but put it simply, if I define a method to be static using this funny at symbol followed by a static method, and then if I don't include self, so no self, then it means that that method is static. I don't need to create an object if I want to use it. So I can actually just put the name of the class followed by the name of the method. However, if I then instantiate an object and try to call the same method, it will give me an error because that can only be used um, on the class level rather than object level. It's um, you might think, well, what's the point of it? Um, it can come in useful in more advanced um, object-oriented designs. Um, if you're interested, do have a look up why uh, people use static methods. But you don't need to use it um, in your course work. It's very likely you're going to use it. And also, um, now I've only mentioned that um, when you instantiate an object, it creates a reference which gets stored in variables. So um, effectively, objects are always passed by reference. The reference is going to be a memory address which points to where the object has been created in memory. So this is very much similar to the idea of pass by reference. So any then um, manipulation you do on the object will impact all of the references. So in order to access methods, we use the full stop, as we, I've already mentioned. Um, and yeah, we always pass by reference with objects. Now is a good time to pause. Object-oriented programming is best learned through practice, okay, by doing actual object-oriented programming. Um, you can learn the principles of it really easily by reading a book or anything like that, but you will honestly find it very difficult to access the exam unless you practice. So on this slide, I've got um, a link to three areas of my IS Codes website, um, and they're split into challenges. So these are all object-oriented programming ch uh, tasks, uh, challenge one, two, and three. Um, it's best to start at Challenge 1, if I'm honest with you. Um, challenge 1 will basically take you through the basics um, and you allow you to practice just using objects and uh, messing around with methods. Challenge 2 will allow you to actually do a bit more coding, a bit more addition to uh, what we're doing. And then finally, Challenge 3 is going to get you to actually start doing some design. So work your way through Challenge 1 and 2. If you get stuck on Challenge 3, that's fine. Maybe go through a few more of the PowerPoints, uh, do a bit more practice and you should be fine.